Heavenly Father, once again, we find ourselves gathered to worship you. Lord, in just a very brief time, in a week's time, a lot can happen in life. A lot of challenges. Lord, there's always things that take our attention and our energies. And so, Father, we come together today to worship you. Father, to be sustained by your grace. Father, encouraged by your word. Lord, spurred on by one another. And So, Father, help us to be the body of Christ that you've called us to be. Lord, help us to, in this very brief time, to, with the help of your Holy Spirit, uh, set aside uh, all the distractions and the disturbances uh, that might captivate our thinking, the what-ifs that dance in our minds, and look to the author and the perfecter of our faith. Father, as a God of all comfort, we would ask that you would minister to those that need that. And Lord, as we come before you, we recognize that it's not uh, not always roses. It's not always the uh, uh, easy path that you've called us to in Christianity. Lord, there is the, the picking up of a cross and there's denying ourselves and in doing that, as we've been set apart, Lord, we recognize there are people that uh, set us apart as well. That relationships can be strained and broken because of the, the faith that we have, because of the proclamation as Jesus as our Lord. And So, Lord, in that, we, we sometimes grieve and we need your comfort. But, Lord, also, we recognize that there's the frailty of body and, Lord, I want to pray for Jerry Merrill as uh, he has not been well. We're thankful that he's doing better, but we pray your healing touch on him and your sustaining grace and are thankful, Lord, that uh, he's able to, to be doing better and pray that as he's resting today, Father, that you would uh, help him to enjoy your rest, Father. And, Lord, I pray as well for Ron Mason and, Lord, you know, the the pain that he is experiencing, you know, the, the uphill battle, the fight that he's trying to fight, a good fight. And so, Lord, we pray for him. Pray your healing touch. Pray for Lynn as she has to stand beside him in this difficult journey. And we, Lord, we pray your best for them, Lord, that you would be with them and they would recognize and feel your presence very close as they go through this difficult time together. <clears throat> And Lord, as we look at the world around us, and as, as we've discussed a little bit earlier, we, we are in election season, <clears throat> and in some ways we are dual citizens. Lord, this, this is not really no longer our home. Uh, we have that secured in heaven, Lord, but at, while we are here, we have a responsibility, a civic responsibility. And so, Lord, lead us as we vote. To, to vote for the person that you'd have us vote for, Lord, that we would look at the biblical principles behind that. And so, Lord, we, we give thanks for that as well, that we're able to be part of that process. Uh, we acknowledge, uh, Romans uh, tells us very clearly, that you establish, that you can raise up and you can remove leaders. And so, Lord, we recognize that your sovereignty in that <coughs> But we also look to our responsibility in that. So, Father, help us in those things. And we pray, Father, where there is wars and rumors of wars. Lord, sometimes that's in our city streets. Sometimes that's in our schools. Lord, sometimes that's in uh, your, your chosen place of Israel, <clears throat> Ukraine, and places around the world that we probably don't even hear of, Lord. Uh, we, we look forward to and have that hope in the time when there's a new heaven and a new earth, and there's no longer any of these kind of battles and the ravages of sin that we have to deal with. But Lord, we pray for your peace to come to those places. We pray for people, Lord, whether it's uh, families in schools and communities that are ravaged by violence, Lord, that you would be their healer, Lord, that people would help them to be led to you, Father, the one that can comfort us in these difficult times. 
And Lord, as we get once again into your word, into Colossians, which is uh, it's like reading a letter for today, Lord, we pray that you help us to not only interpret it properly, but Lord, apply it to where it makes a change in our life. And as it changes our life, it changes our family. And as we change change families, we change church, and churches change communities. And communities can change culture. And so, Lord, we want to be that infecting force. Lord, as contagious as the common cold in this community for your glory. Thank you for what you're doing, Lord, as we looked at last week. Seen and unseen. Lord, you at work. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I've been thinking a lot lately, but uh, again, even this week, and matter of fact, Les's prayer during prayer time reminded me of the privilege, I think it was, being old, I guess you might say, or older, uh, of growing up in a time that for the most of us, we grew up in a Christian country. We, there's always been a religious secular aspect to that, but especially you know, most of the days that I grew up in, and I think for a lot of you, the, the chasm <clears throat> between religious and secular was more of a, a crack or a fissure. It wasn't, it wasn't as large as it's become today. And now we're looking at, we're no longer a Christian nation, we're a post-Christian nation, and it's a secular nation. And for us that, that we are reminded and remember how it was, I, I think it's very challenging for us. And I think because of that, at least for me, as I, I, as, as I was pondering some of these verses, when I think back of just the basic morality up until around the 60s or so, uh, the civility that was in school, the patriotism, just a lot of things that were, were commonplace for me and my experience it's really hard for me to see myself as the Apostle Paul underlines here in verse 21. And I don't think I'm the only one that we read this and we say, yeah, that, but that wasn't me. Once you were alienated from God, you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. Now, I wondered, and I don't have an answer to it, but I, I wondered why at this particular time, after five verses of the most Christ-centered, exalting, speaking to the supremacy and superiority of Christ Jesus anywhere in Scripture, he would suddenly, after that, where we're saying hallelujah, uh, shine a spotlight so clear on our depravity. Because that's what he does here. Now he does say, once you were, it's in, a, it's in the past tense, formally, I think, in, in some versions. Uh, he's speaking to our condition before salvation, before this reconciliation. It's interesting because, in a sense, he's, he's going back five verses because if you remember in five verses, he said, we are formerly, what, in the kingdom of darkness, but he has transferred us we are now into the kingdom of his son whom he loves. But even in that, even though there's this transfer now, he, he, he wants to bring us back to this reality. There was an alienation. There was a separation due to sin. We see that Genesis chapter 3. One of the first things you see that was initially just someone who had intimacy and walked with God in the garden now is hiding once this found out and the proclamation and the curse is, is disclosed by God as it's spilled from the garden and we see this separation. Uh, we see the separation in Isaiah. The Old Testament it talks about in chapter 59 that our iniquities have separated us from God. Ephesians chapter 2 does a good job of saying the same thing. Because of our sin, we are now separated from Christ Jesus. And so... This, this separation, this, this, the reality of our position before Christ 
uh, before this redemptive act, before this reconciliation took place is very, very, very prominent. And he makes a point of, of showing that we're alienated, but it's not just an alienation of a proximity, like being kicked out of the garden. It's in our, our very souls. It's, our, it's in our very being. He's, he speaks about the minds here. Uh, it, it has affected the, the sinful, fallen part of us, has, has an influence on every aspect of our human nature. And we see that, you know, you could go to Galatians chapter 5 and read the acts of the sinful nature. But I just want to read out of, out of Matthew what, what Jesus reminds his believers. He says it's what comes out of a person that defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, our motivations, our desires, is evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. And that's not to be an exhaustive list. It's, it kind of reminds me of kind of kicking a hornet's nest. All this stuff boils out. It's just this swarm of sinfulness was our condition. And so we not only did wrong things, our desires were askew and wrong as well. And Romans says that uh, the mind governed by the flesh is, is enabled to submit to God's law or, or can do so. And so that's where we were. The sin has affected our entire being. And if, if we were honest if we were honest with ourselves, we would destroy God if we could. And the cross proves that. Because if it would have been possible, the Son of Glory would have been destroyed forever. We yell crucify. Now, I don't think, because of God's grace, he even allows us to see how dark and sinful we really are. How would you like to have an x-ray of that? So the question should be, maybe you're asking, because I did, why, why is God reminding us of this? When he's already told us that, wait a minute, we're now, we've come from the darkness into the kingdom of his son who he loves. Why, why has he gone backwards on this? And it made me think of the TV series Fixer Upper. That's why I have that title. Because if you remember that show, they, they remodel and completely redo homes for these people. And one of the things they always do in every show, once they pick the home, when they bring the people back to see what they did, they have a picture of the old house out there. When they pull up, all they see is what the house used to look like. And then they open that up. And what's the response? Everybody's, ah! <laughs> I think part of the reason that God has done that is so that we would be able to understand clearly the depth of his grace and love and what reconciliation has really done for us is for him to say, look, this is what you were. This was you. This is every human being since the fall, since Genesis 3. But we're, we're about to pull back the curtain here. And you're going to see what God can do. And so his remedy here is then his reconciliation. And if you look at it, it says, but now he, who's that? That's God, has reconciled you by Christ's body through death. So those of us that were separated without hope, without God, as it says in Ephesians chapter 2, that is talking about here. Now we are the object of his reconciliation. This is something that God has initiated. We did not initiate this ourselves because in our sin we are separated from him. And 2 Corinthians says that in all of this was from God who reconciled us to himself. 
We sh that, should, that should get an amen and a hallelujah. And so, again, the question would be, why would God do that for us? When we are sinful, when we're enemies, when we've rebelled... Well, Ephesians tells us that because of his great love for us, God demonstrated his love for us while, while we're what? Yet sinners. Christ died for us. His great love for us. And remember, reconciliation is that someone who is estranged and an enemy is brought together reconciled and becomes a friend. And like I mentioned last week, it's even, to me, even greater than that because we're not only called friends, but we are now children of God. So it's even a greater intimacy. But the nuance here is if, if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we've been given the what? The ministry of reconciliations ourselves. But here's the difference. When... The re word in reconciliation that we are given has a limit on it. Basically, it's saying this, that we are making peace with somebody who is an enemy. That's all. We're no longer enemies. We, when we look at them, we're no longer upset by them. When we see them in a safe way, we don't go a different way or down a different aisle. It's just we're okay. With it. We're, we're at peace. But it doesn't have the coming back together as a friend. God's reconciliation is that we are brought back together in this relationship, this intimate, close relationship that we are to have. And, and so we, it affects, as, as you say, if we're completely reconciled, then it's going to affect our mind and behavior. Now this, I think, sometimes confuses us, does it not? Because if we've been, if we've been brought into the kingdom of light or the kingdom of his son, if we are now a new creation in Christ, if we've been redeemed, if we've been justified, we're, we're, when he looks at us, it's our, our legally, our, our sins have been paid for. When we look at all those theological terms of our position now in Christ, we have the mind of Christ, according to Romans. Uh, but does this always work the way it's supposed to? James talks about it really being kind of a little incubator for sin because this is where it's first born. And so since our mind and our hearts affect our behavior, we, we can have this position. We, we can be in Christ. We can be redeemed. We can be reconciled and all these sort of things that we are. I'm assuming everyone in this room but it doesn't mean at this point that we have this all together. That is a, that is a process that God is doing in you. And the, the work he's begun, he will see to completion. Amen. He, he's in the business. But if you wonder why as a, as a Christian or as a redeemed person, how, why would I have that thought come into my mind? Or why did I act like that? That was just me last night. Why? Because we, we we're not quite there yet. But God is going to see that. He, he will see that because Romans 8, 29, he, his goal for us is that we will be conformed into the image of his, Christ, his son, Christ Jesus. Now, that may be a glorification for some of us before we get quite to that point, but it, it's going to happen. And so when we look at this, when we see the really who reconciled us and what it took to reconcile us, and when we look at what it costs to reconcile us, we see the cost of this reconciliation because if you look here, it's through Christ's body through death. Now that's an important, I, I, don't, I don't think that the, the Apostle Paul just added that little bit just trying to fill in. It's not like when I tried to turn in something at school and they said it had to have 150 words and so I was coming up with every word I could think of to kind of pack, you know, the sentence. No. 
it's important because more than likely, more than likely, some of the people in Colossae were looking at this and not recognizing what Christ had done, or they were of the mindset that Jesus was just spirit and that he wasn't body like you still can hear sometimes today, and so he, he wouldn't have died. And so he's making it very clear that his body, that death is real. And that's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 4, that Christ died what? For our sins, according to the scriptures. He wants, he wants us to understand that, that in that death, he became our substitute. He paid a price for, for a penalties that we, we're the ones that sinned against God. We, we owed a debt that we could not pay. And Jesus went to the cross as our substitute to pay that. And so this cross then brought this reconciliation, but this now ties it right back to the, the grand reconciliation of when it says that he'll reconcile all things unto himself. Now, that's not a universal that everybody comes to Christ. That's not what it talks about. You could, there's a lot of scripture, you know, Lord, Lord, we did all these things in your name. Go for me. I never knew you. No, that's not what it means. It means there's going to come a time that not only as we've been reconciled, the world will be reconciled, creation will be reconciled, and all these things will be put, brought back into place. And it tells us in Ephesians, there's a reconciliation that happens between the Gentile and the Jew that were also estranged like that. So all this, through this reconciliation, through the cross, is going to take place. And so now he gives us the result of that transformation. If we were watching Fixer Upper, they would be pulling the screen apart. And we should be going, ah. To present you holy in his sight, without blemish, free from accusation, and very similar to what it says in Judah, that he's the one that has the ability, that is able to keep us from stumbling and present you without fault and with great joy, it says in Jude. So now he, he this is an adjective, he's, he's describing that because of this reconciliation, we are going to be presented holy. Now, that holiness, in my understanding, is twofold in this way. We think of holiness, of, we might say this is holy. This, this communion set has been set aside apart for God's use for a holy purpose. We, we are the same way. We are holy in that way. We've been, we've been called and we've been set apart for God's use, for God's purpose, absolutely. But it's not just to set apart that way. We also, this holiness is to affect our mind and our thinking and our behavior. We are now to walk in this holiness. We are to practice that holiness. We are to portray holiness and a, a sanctified life and not only being apart, but being distinct in how we think and how we behave. And so reconciliation is, is not so much just to get us into heaven, but it's to, to get us where God wants us so he can use us for his purposes. So he can put us, in a sense, on display for a world that we are trophies of his grace. That this, this sinfulness, yes, that's where we were, but now look at what God has done. And I think all of us would give testimony that we are affected when we hear a testimony, especially it seems like if it, it was somebody that was really ravished and, and maybe a, captivated by their sin. It was very obvious in addictions or whatever it may be, whatever kind of dysfunctions, and that's what they were and this is what they are now. That's what God's saying. This is what I've done. It reminds me of the demon act with Jesus that was naked, probably profane, couldn't be controlled, chained and all that. 
people were fearful of them. And then we see the scene where he's sitting calmly at Jesus' feet. That's what God can do. That's what God has done in us. Without blemish, that, that should uh, trigger some memories because that is what's required for all temple sacrifices. When they are going to make a sacrifice, what they had to do to bring it before the priest where it would be inspected and they want to make sure there's no spot or blemish, that it wasn't somehow uh, uh, deformed or broken or anything like that. that. That is what is doing. And so because of the cross, God looks through the prism of, of what his son has accomplished on that cross. When he looks at us, he sees us without blemish. Do we see ourselves like that? Do we, do we see other people like that? No. No, because again, some of this is in the future. Some of this is going to be when it's completely done. But this is how God sees us right now. This is our position for us right now. Why? Because God made him who knew no sin to become sin that what? We might become his righteousness. That's the greatest exchange there ever was, folks. Here, I'm going to give you my sin. And I'm going to take on his righteousness. And free from accusation. Legal term. Basically just meaning that nobody can bring any charge against you. So we have an accuser of the brethren. If you go to Job that likes to go daily before God and and say, you know, look at this and look at that. But when he goes before God and uses your name, Jesus stands stands up, it's been covered. Not that's not who that is anymore. We are free from accusation. Now, once again, are you free from accusation in this world? No. There's there's people can lay all kinds of accusations, and some of them may be true. Some of them may be, we brought on ourselves, absolutely. But this is how God is looking at us now because of the cross and because of this reconciliation. It is complete like that. We are without blemish, we are free from accusation, and we are considered holy in his sight. And then there's the reminder to continue. He says, if you continue in your faith, established, um, that word basically means it's stable, spoke of a foundations even, and firm, that's immovable, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. Now, you might say, wait a minute, the, the gospel at this point hasn't been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, so what is Paul talking about there? He may be talking about every creature under heaven of, of the known Roman Empire that they, they had knowledge of, but I think really it's talking about the universality of the gospel that's continuing to be proclaimed wherever, has a, the same appeal, it's the same gospel, it's not to be a different gospel, it's the same gospel that was preached then is going to be preached now around the world to every, every nation, to every creature under heaven, which I, Paul, have become a servant, or uh, I think King James says a minister. So we are to continue in the faith. We're to persevere. And this is the responsibility that we have. Right? I mean, I I, I run into it all the time. We have this this tug of war, this uh, debate, these things that go back and forth on the sovereignty of God. He's absolutely sovereignty. And the responsibility of man. And you will see it here as well. Uh, Obviously, continuing on establishes the fact that you are in Christ. Right? 
I mean, all of you that were, are married here today would probably give testimony that the, the wedding ceremony was not the marriage, right? For it to be a marriage, it has to continue on, right? And when it doesn't continue on, it, it, it's not a marriage. We, we understand that. Where that's where we have this responsibility. And again, I believe some of the Colossians were probably being led astray by the heretical teaching that was coming in, and they were moving away from the hope that they had and the gospel that was proclaimed for them, thinking that they needed something else or something was lacking. And when we start moving away, that's when we're in danger. Now, when, when Jesus gave the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13, he talked is just about that. There's people that sprung up with joy. They received that good news with joy, but what? They, it didn't last. And he gives examples of that. And unfortunately, as a pastor, I've, I've had people that I thought, man, they're just completely in love with Christ Jesus. They just seem to be, as we might say, on fire for God and things like that. And six months later, they're gone. And it's not that they're gone because they got fed up with me after six months. They're just gone. I, I've talked to people, and I said, I, I don't understand what happened. Well, I tried it, but it just doesn't work for me. Then you really didn't try Christianity. You might have tried something that you thought, if you added this, it would benefit you somehow, or this will, will add to, you, to your portfolio in some, some way. That it might have some results for you, but it wasn't really that you were giving your life totally into Christ. And, and so we have to continue on. And part of that continuing on is really this. It is active obedience. Firmly established and steadfast, not moved away from the hope. In Matthew 7, when Jesus gives that parable of the, the man who builds his house on the sand and the man who builds his house on solid rock, a lot of times you'll hear, okay, see, that's what it is. If you, if you build your house on that firm foundation, again, same word that we're using here in Colossians, if it's on that foundation, then it will not fall when the storms come. It is Im immovable, as the word really kind of describes but what did Jesus say there? What was our responsibility in that building project? If you listen to my words and obey them, you are like the man who built his home on the solid rock. We have a responsibility to the grace that we have been given. If we think that we can just come into faith and into Christ and set and percolate and put this on our nightstand and somehow we're going to grow and God is going to bless us and we're going to mature and those kind of things. Not going to happen. We have an ongoing daily responsibility to active obedience, to being in God's word because this is, this is the transforming power in our life. And if we don't do that, if we're not doing that, then we're really deceiving ourselves in that as well. Now, we're going to take communion today. And obviously, these elements, as you look at them and you consider them, blood and the body of Christ Jesus, once again, we are reminded of the cost. And I think being reminded of the cost is important. I... I was thinking, I remember it was kind of a fad a few years ago that you go through a drive-in, you know, maybe to get your, your lunch or something for you or your family, and a car pulls in behind you, and they're going to pick their things up, and you tell the, the, the checker, hey, I, I'm going to pay for the car that's behind me. And I think they called it pay it forward, which it was behind, so I don't know, I don't understand it, but I think that's what it was. But let's say that you did that, 
And all it was was Dale getting a cup of coffee. But what if it was Dale and he wasn't getting a cup of coffee, he was picking up meals for his entire family? The cost is going to make a difference in how you feel about what you just received, does it not? It costs God his very best. The supreme sovereign one that we, we talked about last week, the king of glory, to die on the cross for us, to purchase our redemption, to bring this reconciliation, to make this rebuild possible in our lives. And I can't help but believe that is why the Apostle Paul says, remember, don't forget. It was significant and it was costly for this to take place. But I've done it because my love for you. Let me pray and we will begin with the communion. Here's the prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of your tender mercy did give your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon a cross for our redemption, who made thereby his obligation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, obligation, and satisfaction for sins of the whole world, and did institute, and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we most humbly beseech you, According, grant us that we, receiving these, your creatures of bread and wine, according to your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. And the same night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This was my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink, all of you. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remissions of sins. And as often as you shall drink it in remembrance of me. Amen.